I remember going to the games and getting lifted over the turnstile into the jungle and you just stood wherever there was a space. Um, I remember being sat up on the on the green bars um, all the guys round about me with their old cans of tenant, their wee half bottles of whiskey and the stench and I can still smell it but now actually when I'm talking about it um, folk peeing down the stairs and I, I, it was an amazing experience for a youngster. We were we were parked at the petrol station after the yeah, forge, and the guy kind of stopped in the middle of the road, um, and he was replaying the Rangers goals through his radio, but very loudly. I'm sure, Neil McCann scored, um, and some Celtic fans left a first bus that I won't name, and um, kind of flipped the car out and. There wasn't any windies left in it, put it that way. <laughs> um, I remember the game very, very clearly that the other team got a man sent off after about 10 minutes for either a punch or a headbutt, I can't remember. And the game ended up 4 4. But just before the final whistle blew, the, the scheme for just over the bridge, all the boys kind of came out the trees and ran onto the park and they had chains, knives. Dog chains. Um, I think one of the guys watching us get, get his ear cut off. Um, there was police everywhere. Uh, ambulances came. There was there was kids there. There was women there with a pram and all over a. This, this was over a ride over the gap. Was what postcode you stayed in? Not not what team you supported, but I had bottles through it and chased into dressing rooms and. I've, I've seen a lot in the game, and that, that's the dark side. When you're a bit younger, you think it's a good laugh, you know, your mates, and you're get, getting a wee bit of a scrap. But looking back, it's, it's absolute madness. Hi everyone, you're very welcome to this week's episode of Our Day of a Positive Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, subscribe and click the notifications bell so you don't miss any future videos and updates. If you're listening on audio only on Podbean or Spotify, please click follow. And you might also check out my vlogging channel, Pit Spotting with Podrick. A couple of good vlogs up already, including the Glasgow Derby last month and a lot of exciting matches to come in the coming weeks and months. So don't miss out. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Del O'Reilly over in Bonnie, Scotland, from the Celtic Supporters podcast. I've been on Del's podcast before as well, which I'm going to link down below. It's a very, really good, authentic podcast with Celtic fans, cover all aspects of being a Celtic fan and the Celtic story. So, Del, thanks a million for coming on the show this evening. It's great to have you here. Yeah, mate, I've been looking forward to it, mate. Um, you come on mine, so. So why not, mate? Looking forward to a good chat. Yeah. It's been great getting to know you as well over the last couple of months as well. So like a friendship. Yeah, has been, mate. That's, that's what I like about the podcast, mate. Get, getting to meet new friends that you probably wouldn't have made. So I good to meet you, mate. Good to yeah. become a friend. Hopefully we'll get a, a beer in the coming months, mate. Yeah. Over Celtic Park now, the help of God. So on that yeah. note, we'll, we'll drink to that and do our usual cheers and good health. I've got the... I'm on, I'm on the look at it, mate. But Luke's I'm, I'm not far behind you. <laughs> but, um, so, if you maybe, for those who don't know you, Dale, can you maybe give a bit of background about you, about where you grew up and how your life started out? Hey, I grew up in a, a place called Motherwell in Scotland, the, the, the steel town. Um, obviously, the Ravens Creek Steel Works and that used to be... Um, a wee scheme house mistake just outside Motherwell called called Muir House. Um, Mark Brennan is pretty similar to most working class people growing up, mate. Um, mum and dad, my dad worked in the steelworks. Um, my mum worked in the sewing factories before becoming a, a teacher in a, a special needs school for, for 30 years. Um, 
growing up, growing up was great, mate. A very, a very much family orientated community where, where I grew up in Malibu. Uh, just a small housing estate just outside Malibu, next to Malibu Football Club. Um, I grew up, growing up was good. A very much family orientated housing estate or scheme, as you call it. Everybody knew everybody. Um, very, very close knit. Very, very working class kind of a labour struggled, if you want to call it, kind of place. Um, everybody's jobs in the, the steelworks, the trickies, is, everybody was the same, on, on the same level. Uh, all the kids were friends, all the parents were friends. And my, my, my upbringing was great. My mum and dad worked hard and provided for me and, and my two sisters. And I can't complain about upbringing me. It's, it's made me her another day, which... Might not be a good thing sometimes, but um, aye, my, my upbringing is brilliant, mate. School life is good. And I say I'm still friends with everybody I grew up with. And still, still keep in touch with people from for my roots um, 40 years on, mate. Good. Were your parents impacted by Thatcher? Was there any job losses and stuff with the, the yes. Thatcher's policies? Yes, mate. Certainly the the town of Motherwell was kind of decimated with with Thatcher. Um, the the steelworks of the Ravens Craig was, was closed down with Thatcher late eighties, I think nineteen eighty nine or nine ninety two maybe. So I the between Motherwell and, and Wishaw and towns in Lanarkshire beyond when, when the Ravens Craig closed the the mass unemployment in our area was was phenomenal, the, the amount of men. I know my dad, my uncle and, and my granddad were, were affected by the closure. So, But as as my family always done, they, they made the way that they had and my dad was straight back into work. And we never wanted for nothing growing up. We never had a lot as a family, but we never, we had food on the table and we had, we had shoes on our feet, mate. So I can't, I can't complain about my upbringing, mate. It was a very, very good upbringing. Very good, very good. So just maybe take us back, maybe the beginning of your association with Celtic. When did you first start becoming a Celtic fan, or were you always one? Born a Celtic fan, Pad. Born, no, no choice. Um, my full family's Celtic. I'm, I'm, my partner's family's Rangers now, but my full extended family and my mum and dad's side, Every one of them are all are all Celtic fans. So when I was in the womb, I was a Celtic fan. Um, grew, I, I was a late starter, e- even though I started going to the games kind of early nineties. It was it was quite sporadic because my dad was always heavily involved with, with youth football. Um, he ran the local club club in in Motherwell, Netherdale Community Football Club for. The best part of 25 years of his life he was there, the, the boys club right through. So if I was probably two or three year old, I, I just followed my dad all over Scotland and Lanarkshire and different areas. So it wasn't until I into my teens before I, I properly started following Celtic. But as a youngster, it was just kind of games here and there and whatever games were on the TV, I was, I was always watching. Do you remember your first time at Celtic Park? 93. Um, Sheffield Wednesday, pre-season. I think, I, think, I think it was two each. I think I've spoken about this before, and I don't know why I've never looked it up, but it was definitely Sheffield Wednesday um, and the main, the, old, well, the main stand at, at Parkhead. Uh, I think it was there with my dad and my uncle. That, that was my, my earliest kind of game memory, but my, my most memorable, kind of vivid memories of my, my earliest going to the Celtic game was the, the Hampden Park season before uh, the new stadium was built. My, my cousins and some of my, my pals that run the, the Notre Dame Celtic Supporters Club in, in Motherwell, um, that's still running to this day over, over near, near enough 30 years that club's been running. So I used, I used to go quite frequently that season. I would have been about 11, I think. I went to quite a lot of games that season. That kind of period kind of 
was one of the lowest of Celtics history, wasn't it? Like they were dark days. Yeah. Barely, barely finishing in the top two sometimes. Like they finished third or fourth some seasons, like, you know. Yeah, I think, we, I think we actually finished fifth one season. Yeah. But, um, but at, at that age, 11 year old, I think. Just, just going to the games was was a, a right. I'm, I'm glad I experienced going to Hampton. Um, as I've said it a million times, it's so many swings and roundabouts being a Celtic fan that it's good to have experienced those bad days. Now that we've been so successful the last two decades, I can put it into perspective and take it a wee bit easier what happened last year, knowing what where we've came from. Yeah, absolutely. The jungle at Celtic Power. Can you maybe explain to people who are not familiar with the history of Celtic Power what the jungle was like to actually stand in? I was, as I say, I was, I was only 10, 10 or 11 at the very few times that I did experience it. I remember going to the games and getting lifted over the turnstile into the jungle and we just stood wherever there was a space. Um, I remember being sat up on the on the green bars. Um, mm. All the guys round about you with their old cans of tenant, their wee half bottles of whiskey, and the stench. And it, I can still smell it but now, actually, when I'm talking about it. Um, folk peeing down the stairs. And I, it, I, it was an ama- amazing experience for a youngster. Um, it's good to see the likes of the standing sections and stuff like that coming back, but I don't think you'll ever see anything like that again. Like the, the old the old stadiums for the, the 70s and 80s and stuff, that health and safety will, will never allow stuff like that again. But uh, it's an experience that will, that will live with me forever, certainly. Hopefully we won't see a return of piss coming down the aisles as well, like, you know, so. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm happy, I'd be happy enough with that not making a return. So, can you remember your first Glasgow Derby? I suppose it was all form in, in those days, but um, can you remember? Um, I think my first one was Maravchik's debut. Um, I was actually playing football that day in, in uh, Paisley, which is just outside Glasgow. And I can remember the game going to extra time, so we never actually got into Parkhead until... Celtic were winning 3-1 when I arrived. I'm sure it was actually Giovanni Van Donkers that scored the goal. Um, that, that, was, that was my first derby. Um, my, my first season ticket is where the now standing section is, where the Greek brigades are. So, aye, that, that was my first one. 98, I want to say. Could be wrong. Could be wrong. I think it was 1998, but so, sorry, you said that you went into the, the... By the time you got into the stadium, Celtic were 3-1 up. Yes. You must have yeah. been kicking yourself if you missed the three goals, were you? Yeah, but at that time I was playing boys club football. Um, okay. We, we, we never did. We were, we were a very successful football team, so okay. um, it was a Scottish Cup tie that went to extra time. So. Yeah, you couldn't do that. Uh, no, yeah. it's I, I missed the first... I missed the first Celtic goal a few weeks ago because there was a delay getting in and they scored in the first five minutes and I was absolutely raging. So I missed three goals in the first half. I'd been apoplectic, like. But um, no fair play if you were still going to the game. A lot of people would have just watched on TV. After. Yeah, half half time. Mate. Again, as soon as the half time whistle went, so yeah. I to experience that first time. It, I don't think it would have mattered because I was in for the last ten minutes. We won five one, so it was, it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I think that was ninety eight, ninety nine season. All right. Yeah. Libo Libo scored Libo scored to his debut. That was yeah. that was my first experience, mate. Yeah, very good. When you were younger, was there any kind of standout player that you looked up to, we'll say, when you first started? Um, for the kind of early 90s, um, it, it's strange that even though I was a massive Celtic fan, but when I was younger, I, I was mad on Italian football for some reason. Um, my dad was an avid watcher there. It was on Channel 4 every Sunday, if you remember. Football Italia, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But when I was growing up, but Paul McStay and then a wee bit later, obviously Henrik Larson when I was going to the games more regular. But um, I, I, I always liked the uh, kind of Franco Brazi and 
Paolo Maldini and guys like that when I was growing up because my, my kind of first memory of football or Italian night. But um, aye, Paul, Paul McStay definitely was the first player I was kind of an icon and a hero to me growing up. Aye. Italian 90 was also a very good time for, for the Republic of Ireland to get to the quarterfinals. It, it was. So obviously your name would imply that you have Irish blood in you, Dale. What's the connection? Do you know? I've actually not get any notes down, but um, all, all my ancestors from my mother's side and, and my dad's side are, are Irish ancestry. My mother's maiden name's McArdle. Um, I have looked it up where the, where the family name originates from, but ignorantly I've not got it down in front of me. I can't remember off the top of my head, but... Yeah. That's why I know it, it's, a fairly, um, it's a fairly common name in Ireland anyway, O'Reilly, so it could yeah. be anywhere, anywhere in the country, so that's good. So I suppose growing up as well, Del, that would have been during the, the Troubles in Northern Ireland and that obviously it was a, it was a tense time, I imagine, in the west of Scotland as well with sectarianism and that, that obviously the, the tensions from the north of Ireland can spill over into Celtic Rangers matches. Yeah. Did you ever encounter much sectarianism yourself or any anti-Irishness growing up because of your surname or that you're a Celtic supporter or that? Not, not, not as a youngster. Not as a youngster, no. Um, obviously, we grew up going to Roman Catholic schools, but we, we mixed a lot with Protestant school, schools and were, were very good friends growing up. Um, obviously, when you're, when you're that young, you're... You're not kind of aware as much at that age of, of what's happening. Even though now as I've, I've grew older, I, I know a lot more about it. But no, certainly not growing up where I was from and, and the people I was with. I think my mum and dad certainly kept me away from that kind of stuff as well. But starting to go to the games is when you start to realise the hatred. And to be honest with you, for the 90s to now, I've I've never seen it as worse as it is just now. Um, I think that's all down to social media, other than stuff you get on the street. Um, going back to the games when we were younger, going to going to the what was the old firm game, the walk up to Celtic Park and the police segregation and the shouts in the ground and that were were vile and horrible and coming to both sets of fans, but. It's to be expected. It's a century old hatred built on religion, so it's going to happen, and it's still happening now. And it's quite, it's quite sad to see, my thing, to be perfectly honest with you. But the social media thing certainly, certainly helps it on, especially with the younger generation who get probably get pulled into it too much on the likes of Facebook and stuff like that. Yeah, it was interesting actually. I was on the train over to Glasgow from Edinburgh a few weeks ago and there was two two great lads in the train with me Alan and Matt there were two great lads they were, they were very hospitable and one of them went up to go to the bathroom he was wearing a Celtic top on him and this guy came up to us when we were getting off the train and said just give me a heads up there lads there was a fella that followed one of you down the train when, when you went when you when you came back from the toilet and I could tell by the look of him he hadn't good intentions you know so I followed him down he followed him down the stair or the train towards us. And when he saw that he was with me and the other guy, the three of us together, he stopped dead and turned around. So it kind of it kind of begged the question, what would have happened if your man was alone? Like, you know, kind of yeah. you know, he would have ended well. So it's just mental. Um another thing as well, I was surprised to hear, although not that surprised, that you couldn't sing rebel songs or out in public because you, you could be arrested for a breach of the peace so that was kind of uh, surprising you know to hear as well or as I said not that surprising but just when you hear it said in person you know you can't sing rebel songs over here you know yeah, yeah. It's it's, random it's, it's, unfortunately the city we live in yeah. I, mean, I, I go to Liverpool quite frequently uh, to see family and stuff and the Irish bars not down there have got speakers outside of it the rebels onto the street and nobody blinks an eyelid. It's 
It's the Glasgow goal, first ball, and it's where we are. And I, I don't think it's going to get any better with my kids growing up. By the time I'm 10 foot under, unfortunately, it's one of these things I think is going to be there for, for forever. It's, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Here's a potentially controversial question for you. You have Irish, strong Irish connection, Irish ancestry. Would you be a Celtic supporter that would favour the Republic of Ireland ahead of Scotland in international level, or would you? Um, country or birth? My, 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 honest, my honest answer is, and if any of my pals watch this, they'll tell you the truth. Uh, they know I'll tell the truth. I don't really bother my arse about international football at all, mate. If, if Scotland are playing, I like to see them winning. I don't, I don't go out my way to watch the games or be part of it. I, I've been to one, I've been to one Scotland game, and it was in nineteen ninety two or something like that, and I'm forty this year. So I've never been a big fan yet. Um, when I watch international football, I'm kind of watching to see if any Celtic players get injured. Yeah, and the same that's with that. Probably, that's about probably as far as I go. I would, pro- I would probably say if Scotland were playing the Republic. I'm Scottish, so I always want to see them winning. I always want to see my country winning. Yeah, and that's fair enough. And, and that's, I, know, I would have no problem with that. Where I do have a problem with is Rangers fans supporting England. Like, have, they, have they ever watched yeah. Braveheart? Morons. Morons. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, just, I can't get my head around that at all. Like, I, can, I, can understand, yeah. I can understand Irish immigrants in Scotland supporting the country their ancestors or, or that but I don't know mm-hmm. to me that's kind of that's kind of supporting people who oppress you do you know what I mean like mm-hmm. you see a video there like there's a guy wearing, wearing an England jersey at a Rangers match on about the royal family at the time Scottish were going for independence and basically we just literally just say how much money that the royal family brought in and he'd leave if the country yeah. was independent and all that you know it's, it's, it's education mate isn't it Probably the the surroundings of the families are brought up in, unfortunately. And people yeah. people think you're biased because you're a Celtic fan talking about Rangers fans, but it, it's so easy to see that their mindsets that they've not got their own mind. In my opinion, like anything Celtic support, they don't support, and it it's fear of retribution of their own fans. And it's it's utter nonsense, like. Yeah. Palestine be like Israel, but and it goes back, it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, and to still be talking about it in twenty twenty two is quite a, a sad state of affairs. But it's the way it is. It's the way people. Mm. I was going to say bring their kids up, but probably drags a better word. And unfortunately, it's where we are, mate. I don't see it changing. Yeah. I was just picture William Wallace spinning in his grave there, like, you know, in this um, with, with England, with England jersey yeah. on him. Listen, I, I would probably think quite a vast majority of the dark side I'll, I'll read stuff regarding Celtic and what we support and charity work we do and blah, blah, blah. And, and probably, I, I agree with quite a lot of it, but they'll never, they'll never speak up as, as would in a Celtic fan regarding any Rangers, stuff like that. So, yeah. The, the hatred I'll always overcome common sense, mate, probably is the correct words to say. The, the only thing for me that took from the Glasgow Derby a few weeks ago was the lack of Rangers fans in the stadium. I think it would have been better yeah. if they were there to witness it and just the atmosphere and a bit of an edge to it, you know, and just from the point of view, like obviously things went well on the night for Celtic, but if Rangers had won, the, the, the deafening silence that would have been there for the goals, you know, would have been horrendous. Like, you know, I just, I just think, for, I hear that Celtic fans are allowed back into Ibrox in April, from, from what I hear, yeah, I saw yeah. that somewhere. So I think that's a good move, and I, I welcome that. Um, yeah, we're, we're still not, we're still not here, obviously, regarding the the allocation for for the Rangers fans. But I know the Celtic board have come out and say that it's their decision and they'll decide. How many fans come in? But the five hundred or eight hundred, whatever it may be, at, at um, the shit pit, as I call it. Nah, mate. I, I, I would rather they just didn't come back, unless, unless they came to some sort of agreement that it was possibly two or three thousand each, and 
shook on it and done what they had to do and just kept it at that and then never spoke about it again. But eight hundred's just nonsense, mate. I don't I don't agree with it. Um, yeah, it's too obviously smart. Obviously after watching the game the other night and the atmosphere that the Celtic fans created, then we don't need them. Keep them out, keep them away. Okay. I can see both sides of us, but um I just think I think it is good to have a good title race this season between Celtic and Rangers because as, as great as it was winning nine in a row and that, not having Rangers in the league, the league was boring without the, the Glasgow derbies to call us yeah. play. Like, for me anyway, personally, because it was just a cakewalk. Like, you know, it was like the Kevin Bridges joke that a uh, two horse race became show jumping, you know? So it was just kind of, it was, it was, it wasn't enjoyable to watch. Whereas now with Celtic and Rangers going up, and for the moment, at least, it's a it's a tight title race. So I don't think it'll be tight for much longer with the help of God over the next few weeks. Now, Celtic will, will kick on and put daylight between them. But it's been a good season. Like Rangers were on top of most of the first half. But Celtic have clawed it back, which, which is great to see. Yeah, Just yeah. for the Glasgow Derby you've been to, and you mentioned, can you maybe given, did you experience much trouble yourself at those games? The like crowd trouble before um, that? Or? Not. Not personally. I, I seen I, I witnessed quite a lot of running battles. Uh, probably at the early two thousand when I was about eighteen, nineteen. Uh, we used to get the train into Dunmanock with a couple of my pals, uh, Hattie and Piro and a couple of my other mates. And where the where the Emirates is now we used to just be waste ground and old kind of concrete buildings. Mm-hmm. So we used to go up there and stand. And, that's where the police used to bring the Rangers fans down. So, see, seen a bit of bother there, and um, actually seen a car getting flipped over on its roof at, at one of the games up, up at the Ford's Market. Um, personally, I was never injured or hurt or anything like that, but I did, I did see quite a lot of trouble with running battles and fights and stuff like that. Aye. Was that a situation where the guy in the car was wearing a Rangers jersey or something like that, or? What happened was it was the game, so we were we were parked at the petrol station up at the Forge, and the guy kind of stopped in the middle of the road, um, and he was replaying the Rangers goals through his radio, but very loudly. I'm sure, Neil McCann scored, um, mm. and some Celtic fans left a first bus that I would name, and then um, kind of flipped the car out and. There wasn't any Wendy's left in it, put it that way. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's mental. He should have known better now, in fairness, though, himself. Like, you know, you're kind of going into Celtic territory. Celtic end of the stadium, mate. 30-odd thousand people there. And we've just lost the league to our biggest rivals, three now at home. So I don't know what the guy was expecting to happen. Yeah. Mental. So you were a decent football player yourself, Del. Could you maybe give us a bit of background about your own history playing the game? <coughs> yeah, I was all right, mate. I was, I, I was a good enough player. I think if you asked anybody I played with, I was a decent enough player. Um, I played with Netherfield Community for about eight years. That was my boys' club. Um, I've always been successful. I've always played with very, very good football players from, from 10 right up to four or five years ago when I stopped playing. So. Won probably 20 or 30 trophies with Netherfield, league titles, local cups, um, the Scottish Cup, which was the biggest trophy you could win at that level, we won as well. Right, yeah. um, before then, kind of, unfortunately, the club disbanded, just due to quite a lot of the guys going kind of throwing stuff because they had very good players. Unfortunately, I chose the, the pub and the women and the fags. Um, so I never actually played football for a couple of years after that. Just kind of enjoyed being young, mate, and getting out and partying and stuff. Um, and then came about the, the Bullfrog Bar in um, 2003. I started that up, just a few of my mates. And it literally just ended last year after 16 years, mate. And it was, I was probably involved with the club of it between 10 and 12 years over the sixth year. Uh, it, was, it was the best 
it was the best time of a footballing career, even though it was only Sunday. Uh, I could have always went and played a, a better level, maybe Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon, but I really enjoyed playing with my pals, and that was always a big pull for me, plus running my own club for the pub where I've always lived. Was, was a massive thing for me, mate. And obviously, with the supporters bus that will get to, but I got a game with the Bulldog 20, 20 plus trophies, 26, seven trophies, I think. So I have probably won an excess of 50 titles, where I was 12 up to I was about 34, 35, mate. And I was the same as Celtic. Yeah, yeah, mate. We actually, with the Bulldog, yeah. Um, we kind of ran along with, with Celtic when Brendan Rodgers took over. We won, we won six or seven league titles in a row and we won a treble the same year as the Invincibles and stuff like that. So, aye, it was, it was phenomenal times. And... Brilliant. Um, you were saying as well that sometimes in the pub games that the Glasgow rivalry between Celtic and Rangers could manifest itself as well from time to time. Is that right? Aye. It, it, it was unbelievable, the rivals we had. Um, we probably had maybe... O- over over the years, we probably had the best part of half a dozen teams that came into the league who were affiliated to the Rangers. As Paul Call was affiliated to Bullfrog Bar with, with Celtic. To a certain extent, I could see where they were coming from, but we had a lot of Marlow fans and Rangers fans and stuff playing in the team. We did we did play in blue and gold hoops, but that's the colour of the bar. Um, but the rivalries were, were something else, mate. It, it was a proper it was a proper derby, old fella, old man I'm feeling it. Four, five, six hundred people at a, a Sunday afternoon match we we had police presence and sending offs high score draws, league titles, games, deciders and I it was that's that's why I liked it as well. Just I was uh, I I like to tackle. Um, it, it would be fair to say so that's the kind of game that I absolutely love playing and, and lucky enough to score a few goals and win a few titles over over rivals at the war office and Max Barr and Dykehead for shots and stuff like that. So Best, best days of my life, mate. There was one occasion where there was weapons used after one of, one of the matches, wasn't there? Yeah, a few occasions. But one, of, one of the games, it wasn't actually a, an old firm derby such, but we played a team that's quite close to our scheme. I, I won't mention any names. Just in case, yeah. but, <laughs> um, I remember the game very, very clearly. That the other team got a man sent off after about 10 minutes. For either a punch or a headbutt, can't remember. And the game ended up four four. But just before the final whistle blew, the the scheme for just over the bridge, all the boys kind of came out the trees and ran onto the park and they had chains, knives, dog chains. Um, I think one of the guys watching us get, get his ear cut off. Um, there was police everywhere. Uh, ambulances came. There was. There was kids there, there was women there with a pram and all over a this, this was over a rivalry the gap was what postcode you stayed in. Not not what team you supported, but I've had bottles through it and chased into dressing rooms and I've I seen a lot in the game and that that's the dark side of it. When you're a bit younger you think it's a good laugh, you know your mates and you're get getting a wee bit of a scrap, but looking back it's it's absolute madness. Um, yeah. I watch Sunday football that now and you don't see much of it happening. But back back then it was it was tough. It was a tough, tough game to play on a, a Sunday. The you were saying in a previous interview there was a bit of an edge with do you you played for a different team before the Bullfrog? Was there a bit of an edge there between you and the previous team? Is there? Oh, what happened was um, I actually started the I actually started the team and it was the pub up the road that was called the Cherry Tree Bar, still there just now. Um, based on 
the guy was buying the strips and paying our league fees and stuff like that. So the the first kind of six months of the Bulldog we were called the Cherry Fee. So as time went on, um, the guy just kept letting us down. We were bringing teams back to the bar and there was, there was no kind of post-match drinks or food. And we organised charity evenings and they never brought equipment and stuff like that. So I then approached the Bullfrog to, to take on the team and help us sponsor us and get a strip and stuff. And, and they gladly done it. And it, it was the best move we ever made. So that was falling out between me and the owners other than the, the two pubs because all the guys, the pubs are only about half a mile apart, so everybody knows everybody. There was a couple of spicy battles between between the Bullfrog and the other team there, you were saying things got a bit heated a few times in those yeah. games as a result of that. Like. Yeah, so, probably the probably the war office in, in Motherwell and, and Dykehead for shots were, were the biggest rivalries. They caught, prob, not just because they were Mainly Rangers and we were Celtic, but they were a very, they were two very, very good sides, uh, as were we. So it was always kind of nip and tuck at the top of the league. But I was, all, I was always proud to say that when we started, the War Office won the league, and then we won it, and, and they folded. Um, then Dyke Head came into it a wee bit, and they had been winning the league, and we won it, and they folded as well. So. In, in my time at the Bullfrog as player, manager, secretary, whatever it may be, I've probably made three or four Rangers clubs home, so that's probably better than winning trophies, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. So, as well as that, as well as your amateur football and the pub team, you also formed a Celtic supporters club in yeah. honour of, of Kieran Tierney, who you know. Can you maybe tell us about that? Hi, well, in 2018, it was just it was just a thought that the Celtic buses have, have always ran for, for the area where, where Cairns from. Um not not as regularly as as I would have liked kind of in that time. So a lot of my pals were taking cars in and going to Motherwell and Wishaw and different areas of Lanarkshire to get a supporters club. So me and my, one of my best mates, Barney, just, it was just a thought one night when we went down to the pub and met four or five of the guys, had a chat, and probably in two weeks, the, the club was forums, the bus was put, the membership was sorted, um, Barney sorted all, all the paperwork to, to sign, and I it was a kind of overnight success. Um, I lasted two or three years before I started taking the kids to the game and I drive in most of the time now, but the bus has went for like 12 members to, I'll give a shout out to Joe and, and DJ Ward, father and son, who, who took over the mantle of the KT and they run a 52-seater now, it's it rammed every week. Um, it's a fantastic bus, mate. And it, it was a no-brainer to, to call it the KTCSC, even though he left like two years later, I would I would never change it. It's it's a boy who's grew up in the area. Everybody in the bus knows who he is. They know his family. He always pops into the pub and he could drop, drop stuff off. And I it was a no-brainer calling it the KT. And I'm glad I started it and I left it in very capable hands. It's a fantastic bus, mate. If, if you're ever over and you get a chance, Certainly experience it for a, for a match day, mate. Leaving to the pub, getting into paradise. It's super, mate. Excellent, yeah. We'll do. We'll, we'll hold you to that. Are you in touch with Kieran at the moment? Have you spoken to him recently? Nah, nah. I, I, I speak to his dad. Um, I know I know Kieran's extended family more, more than I know the wee man. Uh, when I was at the Bullfrog Bar, he was he hardly missed a game. He was there. He was there more or less every week. He was he was absolutely phenomenal with it. With the club, we helped sometimes with training and bought them strips, gave the boys boots and all that. Is you probably heard people saying a million times how how down to earth and such a nice boy is, and it's just it's a credit to his family because all, all his family is exactly the same. Mate. They're, they're, they're no different. They're, 
working class people for a working class area. Kieran's done well for his cell and he's no trying to single back. Um, I'm better kind of pals with his, his cousin Aidan, who I see every now and then for a fight. I keep in touch with his da, Nick, have a fight with him and his uncle, his uncle John and that lot. But no, nah, I don't really speak to the wee man. I keep a very, very close eye on his, his career, as I always will. But I am proud to have started the bus and his name, mate. Hopefully it lasts for, for a long, long time. That's very good. So, the podcast. Yes. Fellow podcaster, I think we started in around the same time as well, coincidentally. Yeah. We're kind of at a similar growth level as well. It's not as easy as it might look from the outside. You know, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Can I maybe ask, what was the inspiration for you behind it? What, why did you decide to do it? Probably boredom, to be honest with you. Um, I, thought, I, I enjoyed talking, and I especially enjoyed talking about football and Celtic. And I think probably the supporters club was a wee bit to do with it, because there's so many supporters clubs in Scotland that the, the first few that i done were, were more or less talking about how the supporters club were formed and where they came from, stories about the bus and stuff like that. So I, I was interested in that more than anything, just getting a wee viewpoint to the different buses across Scotland. And I think I maybe done eight or nine. It, it was quite interesting and kind of moved on to obviously the, the My Celtic story and just kind of general chats about Celtic and kind of veered off onto different angles, mate. But it's a wee bit, a wee bit of boredom and it's the way my head works, mate. If I'm not, if I'm not doing something, then I get agitated. I need, I need to be constantly on the go. But um, it's came to a wee bit of a halt, you know, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm fed up with it, but I'm probably fed up with myself. To be honest with you, I, I need, I need a wee bit of, I need a wee bit of time, mate, to yeah. concentrate on the family and and the work. Um, I'm working away quite a lot in the next few months, so I've kind of binned my Facebook and I've not been going on YouTube. I keep a wee eye on my Twitter, but I'm going to have a few months off, mate, to maybe May time and just do nothing. I maybe jump on a couple of the boys' weekly and stuff, but no, nah, I, need, I need a wee break off at all. Yeah. yeah, I've taken breaks as well over the year as well, and um, you know, you come back with a refreshed outlook and your batteries are charged but for people who want to check out your podcast we'll put the link below in that and um, yeah. there's a good back catalogue of episodes that you have really interesting stories you've spoken to people sells abroad as well not just in Scotland you've yeah. obviously had a few Irish guests on as well including myself yeah um, two or three so, yeah in America or different places in America and that so I, it's, it's been really interesting and get, as I said before, it's, I've enjoyed it the most getting to know people like yourself and Paddy and the boys from the Jungle Gym have ended up really good pals with Paddy and Big Juddy, who I never knew. I'm, I'm in constant contact with the big man now as well and Irish Mick I've spoke to as well and talking Philadelphia and Newry and all over the place, mate. So, aye, it's been brilliant, mate, just meeting new people and hearing yeah. people's different pers- perspectives on their, on their Celtic story. Yeah, and you have a very similar approach to myself as well as that it's kind of relaxed and casual, like we've had one or two in the pub there, like, you know, and as you can see, with the, the same atmosphere I kind of aim for, like, in fireside chat. So, yeah. it's good, so well worth checking out. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I miss, mate. E- even though... This is the, the way forward, mate. I, I much prefer either. A, a, I'm going to build a new man cave at the back, hopefully, but I much prefer sitting face-to-face with someone and yeah. uh, yeah. having a pint and a chat and, and setting my camera and stuff up there rather than the, the online stuff. I know this is the way forward. This is what everybody's doing, but I miss the personal touch, even just the, the handshake and a wee pint of beer and sit and get my yeah. chin yeah. for an hour. So I think if I do get back to it and I get my wee, my wee studio about at the back. I'm going to try and get back to where I was at the start. Good. 
just like to give a shout out as well to someone who's been very supportive of both of our podcasts there, the Lisbon girl from, from Facebook. She's going to think she did good work for videos. Yeah, and, you know, unfortunately, videos. Somebody, somebody reported the video, so I had to take them down for some for some reason, somebody reported it on Facebook and YouTube for copyright. Don't know why, but um, I, I, she's been great with us. The videos and that she's done for me was brilliant. I've, I've actually deleted Facebook you now, just having my, my social media break. So I've, uh, I've actually not spoke there for a couple of weeks. So I need to put out in text. But I, I, she's been really good. I can get all these videos and the Jungle Gym guys have been. Great to me as well, mate. And most podcasts have, like on Twitter, sharing stuff and all that, like yourself. And it's the way it should be, isn't it? Yeah. No, there's, you know, there'd be some people are of different agendas and you can be competitive yeah. with that. And like, I suppose, can't be happy all that stuff, mate. Collaboration is the key and the way to go, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah you know. definitely, mate. No, in fairness, just Lisbon Gore for myself as well has been great for feedback and encouragement in the recent episodes and that. So big shout out and I hope you're well and hopefully we might see you over in paradise sometime for, for a game. This season, they didn't start brilliantly, but Celtic looked like to the people between the teeth now. How happy have you been with the season today? Um, I, I don't think it's anything short of a miracle to be where we are than in it. An absolute miracle. Um, I think if we win the league there, it, it's got to be spoke it, it one of the best league titles in, in the history, without a shadow of a doubt. There's no doubt in my mind if we win the league this year, it's, it's got to be up there. The start of the season, I had absolutely no expectations. Um, when, when Big Ange came in and I, I heard him, they cut his jib and the way he was at pre-season and stuff, I thought, right, this guy could be okay, but to have a trophy in the cabinet, to be three points clear after being seven behind in the space of six or seven league games is nothing short of phenomenal. Um, we've had the bumps. The, the Bodo game the other night's one of them. I was massively, massively disappointed in the result. Um, I stand by what I said, the, the club of their stats and the club of your stats and I thought it's one of the worst results in a European history. I thought it was a dreadful result in performance, but I, I got over it quite quickly. Um, I enjoyed the, the Dundee game at the weekend to the wee man. It was fucking nail-biting stuff again. But yeah. to be where we are now, mate, to where we were, nothing short of sensational. We were, we were at the start of the season to now. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this season. Thoroughly enjoyed going to going to Paradise. It's it's been great. And as you spoke about earlier, some Celtic fans will say oh, they don't check the results and this and that. If Rangers are playing before us, I'm watching it or I have it on the radio. If they're playing at the same time, I'm checking my phone. That's what I miss. Yeah. It's a massive, massive rivalry. Even though it's a new club, same fans, same same people. So, aye, uh, it's great. I, I'm loving it. Yeah. No, it's been a great season to date. And Ange has already equaled Stephen Gerrard's um, trophy haul at Rangers after a few months, and he'll probably exceed it in the coming in the coming months, which is great. Yes, I always say uh, Stephen Gerrard's. That legacy in my eyes is not stopping the ten in a row. It's winning less trophies than St Johnston. Is that me? That's that. And he's under a bit of pressure. He's under a bit of pressure. Than the the Villa fans were giving him a bit of stick after the the Watford game at the weekend. So he could be yeah. back at Liverpool under eighteen before we know it. Yeah, I'd say looking back, I know we were delighted with it at the time, and it probably was a pivotal moment in the, in the title race. But I felt it was bad form. Well, he walked out in Rangers, to be honest, you know. Um, it was it reminded me of Brendan Rodgers leaving, leaving Celtic a couple of years ago, you know. I felt it. Yeah. That form. Brendan Rodgers as well, it, he's under a bit of pressure himself at Leicester. And I was just thinking, wouldn't it be ironic if Celtic managed to get through 
to the next round of the Conference League and knock Leicester out. That would be the ultimate karma three years later, like, you know, to get him set. That'd be good, isn't it? That'd be good. Pers- my own personal opinion about the second leg against Bodo, I'd play the kids, get out of it, and just focus on the champion on the on the league because the league is a is the road to the Champions League. You know, yeah. that's my opinion anyway. I, it's, got, it's got to be the main priority, I think. Yeah, and Andrew's Andrew's a manager. You do, you know he's going to put a strong side out. But three three one down. I think with some of the guys I've seen are saying it's nine is ten in the Arctic Circle. Um, and you've got Hibs away on Sunday. I think they they're at home with St Mirren. So, I I I'm with you, mate. I would I would rest a lot. I would I would be playing your your bands and scales and. Mikey Johnson, James McCarthy, guys like that, certainly. I, if we go out, listen, it's a terrible, terrible result, but the the end game is the Champions League and winning the league, yeah. 100%. Mate. I think this season's league is one of the most important leagues to be won in years financially yeah, yeah. because whoever wins, the, is, is it guaranteed a Champions League spot or is it Straight up the group stages. That's, a, that's an unusual one because Scottish teams' performance in Europe haven't been outstanding in the last five, six I years. I think it's a lot to do with Rangers as well, getting to the last 16 of the UEFA Cup in the last two or three years. Mm-hmm. And also Scotland qualifying for the Euros. They're in the playoff for the World Cup as well against Ukraine, which yeah. luckily is luckily at Hamden. Um, so the coefficient is went through the roof for Scotland. So, yeah, Celtic for the Rangers. Hopefully Celtic goes straight into the group. Um, second place, I think. Two, yeah. two playoff games, I think. But still not time complaining because it's brilliant news for Celtic if Celtic can get back into yeah. it. The season, the season at Hamden, then, I'm just curious, what was it like playing at Hamden at home for a season? I was, was, only, it... I was only 11. But I, I can remember like, the, the bus journey in and I can, if I close my eyes, I can remember where it parked and stuff. Um, I was actually luckily seen it beating. In fact, I was at a Rangers game at Hamden as well. Well, 1998 wasn't my first game. I was there when we beat them. I was there when we beat them 3-0 when sure big Pierre scored um, a year at Hamden. Um, I, as a youngster, and not being at loads of games at Paradise beforehand. It was just kind of normal for me. Um, I know what it was like for a lot of the, the old team who absolutely hated it. Uh, not just because they were only playing at Paradise, but just because I hate it. I don't like it. I don't like it in a stadium. I don't like behind... My ass sat behind the goals at the Celtic game that season as well when I was going. So um, I don't like it in a stadium. Um, I, I just I enjoyed the experience at that age going to the games, but overall it's it's a it's a, it's a shithole. I, I, quite a lot of Celtic fans absolutely hate going there. Um, I've experienced Murrayfield when they played Harps a few years ago, and mm. absolute night and day. The experience outside the stadium, inside the stadium, everything about it. Blows Hamden absolutely out of the water, so it does. Yeah, it was one thing I assume Celtic sold out Hamden Park pretty much that season today, or was or no, no, what I empty seats was there a lot of empty seats, yeah, what I empty seats, yeah. Just a comment to make about that, like that Hamden is meant to be the national stadium, but it hosts 10,000 people less than Celtic Park does, yeah, 54,000 or 52,000 at home. I just think for National Stadium, it should be the biggest stadium by far. And I, I heard Scott Brown saying that he would be in favour of Hampton Park not being the National Stadium for, for Scottish football because the atmosphere is terrible. Like even one thing, I've never been to Hampton, by the way, but from watching it on TV, there's like a track round the, the pitches there. Like there's a big gap between the goals and the crowd. Yeah. That's, yeah. That makes a big difference, I think, for atmosphere, you know, but... Morrifield yeah. is a bigger stadium, as you said, than Hamden, and it looks cool from the outside. Morrifield, like you know, so if I if I had a say, if I had a say in 
the SFA, I'd, I'd be kind of trying to get the football games at Murrayfield, to be honest, you know. They, they'll, they'll never do it, mate, because it's, it's filling their coffers, isn't it? It's putting money in their pocket. They hold in the national game, the semi-finals and the finals. It's 52,000 people paying 30, 40, 50 quid plus their hospitality. So they're, they're making millions off a year. So I don't, I don't even think any any rebuild or any kind of reconstruction to the stadium would, would make a blind bit of difference because the way it's built, as you say, where the park is and the distance between the stadium behind the goals is it's it's just very, very outdated and it's it's no it doesn't do a purpose. Obviously going there and winning cups and stuff's enjoyable, but most Celtic fans are I know just don't don't like the place. Even Ibrox is bigger than Hamden capacity wise. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's the third biggest stadium in Glasgow, you know, but it's the national stadium. To me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you know. Nah, doesn't yeah. make, does it? Um, just kind of a quick fire round there, maybe as a Celtic fan, as as best as you can, kind of, you know, I suppose with a tendency for questions like this, people can overanalyze the answers. So I think it's better to maybe go with the first answer that springs to mind your gut your gut reaction. Favorite so, Celtic player. Henrik. Okay. Favourite Celtic game? 5 0 League One, 2019. To win the one double. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, Favourite Celtic goal? Oh. So you know what a last minute was? I'll try and answer it quick. Uh, Henrik Larson, Bob Easter. Okay. My, I said Vinegar Hesselink against Rangers, the two. Yeah, was that that? Was that that? Was game, yeah. well, that, that would be a dream out for me to be at Celtic Park and Celtic get a last minute winner against Rangers. Oh. That would be no, it doesn't, doesn't happen too often as well. I think Tomo got a late goal against Rangers once. It's like Sutton as well. Sutton, yeah, yeah. There was yeah. a year or two there, yeah. Least favourite Celtic game, one that stands out to you. Quick. Fire, right, quick fire. Sit not in a way, Tony Mowbray. How many ones score that day? 4 0. Price. What was your biggest disappointment as a Celtic fan? It doesn't necessarily have to be the worst Celtic team now, but the disappointment. Even including last year, probably. Probably Seville hurt the most, I would say. Seville and the fact we lost the league by a goal a few days later to Kilmarnock was horrific, you know. Yeah, but Fort Park, Fort Park was a really sore one as well. Yeah, that if, for you that must have been even worse as well, actually being from Motherwell, like you know. Yeah, yeah, that was hard going that day. When you said you were from Merhouse originally, I, I, I had in my head I would have Merhouse or my Welsh, so Merhouse too in Edinburgh. So that's yeah, straight, Edinburgh. common ground yeah. straight away, like no Motherwell. Um, would Motherwell be more Rangers town than Celtic would it, overall or is it going to half and half if there was a Motherwell um, I, I would probably say I would probably say kind of, kind of more Rangers than Celtic than Motherwell yeah because was they very good for them but yeah. they don't fill the stadium so they can't they can't agree to anybody else like myself you like the casual clothing you know, yeah. to feel and the Benetton and the Sergio Ticini and that. Did you ever consider getting involved with a form, casual form, when you were younger or anything like that? Or you never? Nah, nah, mate. I was in, I was in loads of scrapes when I was younger with my pals at the weekend, fighting and getting, getting lifted and spending a weekend with themselves and something that never, ever appealed to me. Never appealed to me. Um, and interest me a lot as yeah. crime in, in general does reading the documentaries and stuff like that the casual scene really really interests me I've, I've read loads of books and yeah. different people who would watch a, uh, loads of different documentaries and stuff grew, grew up and know quite a lot of the guys in the, the Motherwell SS who I know who have worked with and stuff like that are, are well away from that kind of that way of life now but always interested me but 
never something I thought get involved in, mate. Nah. It's kind of like myself, I never thrown a punch at a football match either, so we're like smoke salmon casuals, like, you know, so uh, like, smoke, smoke salmon socialists. And someone said that before. On my podcast, I spoke a bit about my own mental health and how my doing the podcast helped me with my battles with it. Have you ever encountered similar battles yourself? Because I know you have, you know, some people who've had some I think everybody battles every day, mate. Just, just how you deal with it. Um, I've never needed medication. I've been in the depths of despair that, that some people have um, been affected by it hugely by losing teammates through suicide and stuff. Um, not just teammates, two good friends, but a lot of my friends have, have been affected a lot a lot wider than me. Um, the Motherwell and Wishaw area is, is such a hot spot for suicide. It's, mm. it's unbelievable how many young lives uh, have been lost here in the last five or six years. Uh, other than the two people that I was teammates and, and friends with, there's been another 10, 15 that I know that have affected us. probably still affects me the day. What, what happened with my pals, but I kind of work and I've got kids and I, and I don't own it. And it's something that I sometimes sit and think about quite a lot. And that's why I do a wee bit of charity work. I try and do at least one thing every year. But um, this year I've decided that the one thing's going to be me <laughs> instead of, I think, as I said at the start, that unless I'm Unless I'm doing something, I'm, I'm agitated and I need, I'll, I'll do a podcast, I'll start a supporters pub up, I'll start a fit team up. And all, the, all these things take up a lot, a lot of time. The supporters club did, the football did, the podcast did, because I was sometimes doing two and three a week. So um, I've decided this year my charity is going to be myself and, and my family and spend a bit more time Instead of doing two podcasts a week, yeah. doing stuff with the kids on the night. So it's affected me in a good way and a bad way because I've been I've been right, right down in the dumps and been really, really struggling. But it, it helps me deal with everyday life. And I know how bad it can be, but we having kids and stuff. I know that I know the flip side of the the dark side, if you like to yeah. say that. But, but I, I was just a wee shout out to Chrissy's house or the, the suicide awareness charity in, in Washaw and Lanarkshire to Anne, the founder um, and all the lassies at Chrissy's house. I've done, done two or three events for, for them and it's a wonderful, wonderful place of saving lives but more importantly try to prevent the loss of lives. That's the big thing, mate. That's that's where we need to go. But um, the government needs to step up, mate. That's that's what needs to happen. In countries, the government needs to step up, and help these places that are funded with people running fucking marathons and getting no money off the government and getting referred to doctor surgeries to go to places that are solely relying on people doing charity work to help people save their lives, which. For me, it's a ridiculous place to be in, but mm. under the Tory and the current SNP government here, then I don't think it's going to change anything, shouldn't it? Mm. Well, fair play to you for supporting them in the past anyway, you know, and sure you, you are doing your bit, highlighting your health where you can and giving people a platform to speak, like me, a few weeks ago. It's great as well. Like I got pretty good feedback from other people watching that. Yeah. That was speaking about my own battles and they've kind of struck a card with them, you know, so the stuff we're doing is good in that sense, you know, as well. Doing yeah. podcasts so. You mentioned earlier, Del, before we wrap up, that your, your partner's family is Rangers. Yes. How does that work? I don't, I just, yeah. well, I don't have any fucking interaction with them, mate. That's that, it's dead easy. Okay. Um, so nah. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just picturing around the, the table there at a family event, you know, like... No, my missus, my missus honestly does me 
bother than asked about that when I saw me. Uh, her, nephew, her nephew and her dad to her died in the world below me are great people, man. I've, I've been in the reef for seven years and I got, I got on great with them. They don't, they don't sit and watch the games together. We get a bit of patter depending who wins or loses. And that's as far as it goes, mate. There's well, no, that's great. That's great. Like, you know, and I think you had a Rangers fan on recently in your own podcast, didn't you? I was trying to get them on. It, it never quite happened. So um, maybe when I come back, um, I'm going in to... May when the league back. is won. <laughs> you, you might well, have a chance. I'd say. Aye. <laughs> aye, maybe, maybe when I, after I have a wee break, mate, in a May yeah. time, I'll, I'll maybe get the, the lads on. I think it would be a good laugh, mate. Yeah. No, it is good, and like I have someone lined up as well, potentially a Rangers fan lined up, and it's good just to have the banter. And I know that you mentioned things get a bit nasty in the rivalry as well, but I suppose at the end of the day, for Celtic and Rangers on its own, it is a game of football. Like it's hard to remember that, you know. So, yeah, yeah. So your plan for the future? What does the future hold for the Del O'Reilly? Would you say after you've had your sabbatical for a few months? Um. I don't know, mate. I've got I've got two young kids, so that, that's that's my main focus. That that's my future is with my two kids and my partner. Um, turning five and eleven this year, so my life's more or less took up with their football and swimming. And I've got a quite I've got a quite a full on job. I work in the railways all over the country, so I'm constant on the go, but. I just want to be happy in the future, mate, and healthy, and make sure my my family are well provided for. And as long as they're happy, I'm still going to paradise every week, and I get my wee podcast studio built at the back, mate. Mm. I'll be quite happy, mate. Like, what do you do in the train station? Was there like? Are you, no, you, mate. You... We 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 totally renew the tracks, so we, we take the machines in, rip out all the tracks, dig up all the stone, and then. We all new stone, new track, new rail, everything. It's uh, 18 years I've been here now, half my life nearly. Um, I turned a big 4 0 this year, so it's been a big, big part of my life. Um, it's kind of followed on to we spoke about at the start. My, my granddad, my uncle, my dad all worked the kind of rail side and the steelworks before Thatcher closed it. And I now work with my, my uncle and my dad on, on the railway as well. So. You kind of follow the tradition for the best part of my life. So you're literally transporting every working day? Everywhere, mate. And I have the, the pleasure on Sunday to be going up to Fort William for anybody that watches us that hasn't been to that part of the country. It's, it's absolutely beautiful, mate. Fort William, the lake, Fort Augustus up to Inverness. It's, it's stunning. Um, that's a good part of the job, as I've seen probably 90% of the, the country through, through my job. And, uh, it's brilliant. I love it. Some people think I'm mental because I work every weekend and work in snow and wind and rain and you name it. But uh, I love it. I love my job, mate. Well, I'm very juice. And that's the other thing to remember as well, I suppose, even myself as well and the other podcasters, most of us do work full-time jobs as well. So it's kind of a side hobby for us, like, you know. But, yeah. Fidel, thanks a million for dropping by this evening. Much appreciated. We'll keep in touch. I'm going to drop the link to your channel below. So, guys, please pop a subscription to Celtic Supporters Podcast on YouTube. I, I know Dale is taking a bit of a break but for the next couple of months, but there are some excellent back episodes there to get stuck into. Where can <laughs> people, I know you're taking a break from, from Facebook. Can people reach you on Twitter? Or follow you on Twitter, Del. I've still got a Twitter page um, at Celtic Podcast sixty seven. Um, I still do some spaces and stuff on that. Um, I done one at the weekend. Um, I was on with, with the homeboys, so I I, I still keep touch with folks as well. Twitter. Deleted my Facebook. Uh, I don't use Instagram. So, I if anybody wants to get in touch with Twitter, that's that's where I'm at, mate. But I, I'm tending to keep away from. Messages and private mails and all that kind of stuff. And then I'll have a wee look on it to keep myself updated with, with some Celtic stuff. But yeah. I've got my head in the place that I'm going to be social media free for, for the next couple of months. 
when you had your Facebook, your username was brilliant. Actually, it was in, inspired by one of Poos and Horses, Del Boy with a H or I, which was very clever. I like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you ever know, you might keep making it, you might come back on at some stage. But in the meantime, you've Twitter anyway, in the meantime, and I'll put the link for that below. So thanks again for joining us, guys. If you're watching YouTube, please like, subscribe, and click the notifications bell. If you're listening audio only, please click follow on Spotify or Podbean. A lot of exciting matches upcoming on my vlogging channel, Pitch Spotting with Podrick. I'm going to be starting going to Cork City Games below in Turner's Cross. I'm going to be vlogging there. I'm also going to be going to the Manchester Derby Sunday week and loads of other big games coming up, including trips over to Paradise with the help of God for later in the season. And maybe a trip to Dell's favourite stadium, Hamden, if the draw works out well for us. So we'll see what happens there. And I'll be on getting on to Dell for tickets to so always the spares. <laughs> All right, Del, so again, thanks a million for coming on. Once again, welcome, see- mate. My pleasure, mate. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you next time on the Parallel Padre podcast. Good night. God bless.